With the first week of the Azeret Sea metagame now behind us, I think it's safe to say that Amethyst Steel is one of the most versatile ink pairings in this metagame. While it's always been a versatile ink pairing in past sets, it hasn't really seen a lot of success in different variations because other decks just seem to pack more punch. But with Azeret Sea, I do think that Amethyst Steel, and I mean the tournament results prove it, has definitely been turned up a notch to be a tier one contending deck to really push decks like Ruby Amethyst and Ruby Sapphire and a lot of the aggro decks that we see having success like Emerald, uh, Amethyst, and so on and so forth to really tight matches. So we're going to cover what I call Tinkerbell Midrange, which I think is going to be the most effective version of Amethyst Steel, more important than the overly oriented control variation and more than the hyper aggro version, both of which are still decent. But this one just seems to be better because it's able to play on curve easier and it doesn't get completely blown out necessarily by other decks. Now again, Ruby Amethyst in the right hands is still a very powerful deck but and still gives this deck a lot of trouble because Ruby continues to just be the answer to steal. But that doesn't mean you can't win because a lot of these Amethyst cards that we got in set 6 are going to be very beneficial and some of which are only beneficial to Amethyst Steel. So let's go ahead and jump in. The first thing you're going to notice is from 1 to 4 we have a very high saturation of cards meaning that this deck is very easy to play on curve like I was saying earlier and then we top out at 5 and 6 cost cards. Only 14 on inkables and 47 inkables for a total of 61 cards. A bit of a diverse card pool in the card types here, mostly Amethyst and a couple of Steel cards. We look at our character count, we've got 10 one drops. We've got two Chernobog followers, four Diablo, four Robin Hood. The thing with Amethyst Steel is there's a lot of very powerful cards in both of these ink pairings, but there's also very powerful cards that are very powerful in certain situations and very weak in others. Calhoun is a perfect example. It's by far one of the best Steel cards, and one of the best cards, honestly, in general, out of Azeroth Sea. But it's very weak into the control matchups. You don't really want to play Calhoun in a Ruby Sapphire match, right? You don't really want to play it into a Ruby Amethyst matchup necessarily either. But you definitely want to play it in an aggro oriented matchup when you're going up against something like Amethyst Emerald. Well, you can mitigate both of those things by just not playing it because Amethyst and Steel still have some of the strongest two drops in the game that are just generically good, like Madam Mim Snake and Mr. Smee. By increasing the number of one drops that you play from 8 to 10, gives you a higher chance to actually resolve a Madam Mim Snake on turn 2 if you don't have the Mr. Smee. Because one of the deficiencies with the Madam Mim package on 2 is that if you don't end up seeing a one drop and you don't have your other two drop, this Madam Mim card is dead because you can't play it on 2. So that's why we've opted for an extra two copies of Chernobog Followers, and lucky for you, being Amethyst and being Steel, all of these cards are high value one drops. The Diablo and the Chernobogs will replace themselves. The Robin Hood sets up for a very powerful shift on turn three potentially, which enables you to sing cards or just continue to quest and lock down aggro boards. Even into control matchups, the Robin Hood is still decent because if it gets challenged out, it at least replaces itself. And it's probably questing for a couple, you know, two to four or six lore in the meantime and or locking down the board with, with, with whatever small threats might be played by your opponent. Take into consideration that when you combine Robin Hood with the Merlin Crab, it just becomes a powerhouse 6-6 body that runs over anything too. So the two drops, nothing to explain here. Mr. Smee also being able to be bounced when it's about to be banished. You know, if it quests for 6 and it's about to be banished and you bounce it back with a snake or a fox, that's just tremendous value in and of itself. You had an overstated body questing, uh, gaining you a ton of lore, and then you just reset the status of the damage on the uh, bounce of the Mim card. That being said, though, even if you trade out the Mr. Smee, get some lore, get a positive trade out of it, it's still a very high value card. It's why it is, in my opinion, the best two drop in the game still. Mr. Smee is a powerhouse. Mim Fox, in my opinion, still the best Amethyst card in the game, but honestly, there's a card that's potentially rivaling it, at least for the metagame right now, and that is the new Genie. This card is quickly taking the game by storm. Every single Amethyst deck is upping it, their game to four copies of this card. And to think I thought I overpaid when I paid $5 a copy for the regulars and what did I pay for the foils? I forget, but definitely not this price. It's absolutely ridiculous. 
When you think back to what set 2's metagame was when we were in, in my opinion, a tier 0 format with Ruby Amethyst, that was really dictated by Minnie Mouse. Who saw Minnie Mouse first? How could we deal with the opposing Minnie Mouse? And this is just Minnie Mouse aggro evolved. It costs one more, it's not inkable, it replaces itself, and it has one more toughness and one more strength. These things are relevant to a certain degree. Now Genie still gets outed by things like Brawl, Ice Block, Sisu, so on and so forth, Big Sisu, etc. But it's very interesting to note that this card is very hard to out through challenging. Whereas there was a number of threats that you could play that would out the Minnie Mouse. There aren't too many evasive threats naturally that you would want to play in your deck specifically to answer Genie. We might get there in this metagame as we see this card becoming more and more of a problem, but right now we're not. And being Amethyst Steel, having the versatility to play Genie, Merlin, Goat, or Merlin Rabbit is an extremely powerful curve when you go some of the best one drops in the game into literally some of the best two drops in the game into some very powerful three drops potentially, especially ones that can boost up and trade up into literally some of the best four drops in the game. And this is why Amethyst Steel works so well. Now, to be fair, most of these are Amethyst. It's why, you know, Amethyst has been a top caller in the game for a while. But the Steel packages do afford you the ability to better deal with aggro, which is very nice, and also put on some aggro pressure of your own, while giving you access to some very unique removal options with Steel, right? Again, I'm not really saying anything new. This is why Ruby Amethyst was also very powerful. You paired the naturally very powerful Amethyst cards with the hard removal of Ruby, that's why the ink pairing was so good for so long and continues to be good. With Steel though, you definitely have a bit more of a toolbox to deal damage rather than just hard remove, which can be beneficial and we can talk about that when we get down to the non-characters. One of the biggest changes and biggest boosts that Amethyst Steel got was the release of, speaking of Minnie Mouse earlier, Tinkerbell, which is the clone of Minnie Mouse. This is a 3 cost inkable 1 3 body that quests for 2 and has evasive. It's the exact same card as Minnie Mouse, the only difference is instead of it being called Minnie Mouse and being in Ruby, it's called Tinkerbell and it is in Amethyst. Why is this so important? Because this is actually a good card that you can then transition from an aggro quester to a board control card in the big Tinkerbell giant fairy from the first chapter. You shift this on 4 and you instantly change the pace of the match. You instantly go from I'm the aggro threat to I'm the control threat now. And a card like this coming down, we all know what it represents. Against aggro, if you get this out early enough, the game is over just on the spot pretty much. It's very hard for aggro to out this card without losing too many resources in the process. And then again, in other matchups, it's just a bigger body that can help you dodge things like Brawl. Where this card gets Brawled in Small Sea Suit and stuff now, which was not around during the time of Minnie Mouse but it's still a great facilitator. You get a bigger body out, and this helps facilitate that on, on two turns earlier, right? Instead of turn six, you get it out on turn four. So your three drop curve is very, very nice. Your four drop curve is also some of the best in the game. And then you have good control options for the mid game. Even as you progress into the later parts of the game, in, into Ruby control decks or Sapphire control decks, you still have the strong, naturally inherent, you know, Amethyst cards like Genie with Evasive, Tinkerbell with Evasive, Merlin Go coming down, gaining lore to still close out games with. You're, you're fast enough in the beginning, you're controlling the game enough in the beginning that your opponent doesn't get too far ahead, and then you're locking things up in the mid to late game with your Evasive Questers, with your board control cards, with your Goats, with your Rabbits maintaining card advantage. Genie maintains card advantage as well while putting on that aggro pressure. So you can see how the deck is really well-rounded and can still push through to a certain degree the control decks even into the late game. And it's why this deck has been so resilient and having success in the tournament scene in the first week of Azure Sea's release and will continue to have success in my opinion. When we look down at the actions, there are definitely some things that raise some eyebrows here. Fire the Cannons is very good once again. Um, this card is good because it just deals with a lot of you know, important threats in the in the metagame right now, I guess. Um, when you take a look at what is actually problematic, um, the aggro decks that have been popping up more and more, everybody's switching strategies to, you know, some form of aggressive strategy, right? The Amber Steel deck that doesn't run songs really anymore, the Emerald Amethyst deck, 
Ruby Amethyst aggro even. Like there's just so much aggro in the format that Firelight Cannons can really just stop certain strategies in their tracks. Ruby Amethyst is still around with the Flynn Rider for example. Simply firing the cannons that shuts off the Sisu line that they would generate a lot of lore with very early. So, you know, there's just so much value in Fire the Cannons. This being an uninkable card, though, you you just definitely have to be a little bit careful of how you're playing it. Um, because it can't be bricky at times. Uh, into Ruby Sapphire, it's still not the greatest, but can still help you get over the line by removing some bigger threats at times. So it's still warranted being played because it is just a very strong card right now in the metagame. This one of Ambush is a very interesting card. It's a three cost uninkable action, so not a song. And it says you have to exert one of your characters to deal damage equal to their strength to a chosen character. So when you have to exert one of your characters, you have to have a character that has the ability to be exerted. So that means you can't like play a character and then try to exert it right away with this card to get value out of it. You have that character has to air quotes dry first. But this card is actually decent in this deck as, as a one of because it can hit ready threats, obviously, that does that do not have ward. But you can target things like exerting a goat, exerting a Mim Fox, exerting a crab, exerting a Smee or a Madam Mim uh, Snake to deal three to four damage to a ready threat that your opponent developed on the previous turn. And that's really good because it's a way for you to out something that your opponent is trying to set up for and it really disrupts their game plan. They don't expect this. I guess that's why it's called Ambush, because it's not really that great of a card, but I think it's good enough in a deck like this that you can run one of it and get away with it. As for your songs, the Triple Zeus in a deck like this goes really hard. Um, I like it more than the Grab Your Swords, because you already have so many threats to, to deal with hyper aggro decks that you, should not, that you should not need Grab Your Swords. And you need better help into the control matchups, and that's why, in my opinion, Zeus just has higher impact compared to something like a Grab Your Swords. You want to be dealing as much damage as possible to a singular threat rather than worrying about dealing widespread damage because you can already do that with your characters to help manage the board state. Friends on the other side, more card advantage in a deck like this that's not hyper aggro. You can definitely afford to slow the game down and uh, opt to sing this for card advantage. That's not a problem. And then just two locations, which again, you could argue that you don't have to play or you could play try you could try to play more in the Queen's Castle Mirror Chamber. This card, as we know, is decent into the Sapphire control decks that sometimes have trouble outing locations. They basically need to see some of their one of uh, location removal like Hideaway or Cusco if they're playing it. Um, and in particular against Ruby Sapphire, once you start locking down the board, Following up with this demands an answer from your opponent and it's going to throw off their game plan to try to develop like Tamatoa Dime or something. They're going to have to try to somehow put a couple of characters on board like Maui and, and something else in order to out this castle. Otherwise, you will run in, run away with the game. Again, it's why Ruby Sapphire traditionally has had trouble with Ruby Amethyst in the past ever since locations have come out. So all in all, that is the uh, Amethyst Steel Tinkerbell Midrange and it's called Tinkerbell Midrange because this deck, in my opinion, really got its teeth with the release of this Tinkerbell, being a Tinkerbell that you actually want to play. The Steel Tinkerbell, you know, is just underwhelming. This card's still an aggressive threat like Minnie Mouse was, but being the card that you can shift the big Tinkerbell onto just provides so much additional synergy with this ink pairing. It is extremely strong. We all know how powerful a Shift Tink was in the first chapter when the small Tinkerbell in Steel was more viable than it is today, but having another valid Shift target just instantly turns a card like this online, um, which is really, really strong. So yeah, that's my version of the deck list. Let me know what you think. Uh, again, this is the list that is probably very close to topping lists, uh, you know, top fouring big tournaments, winning big tournaments. Um, again, regionalized tournaments, nothing like huge like a DLC just yet, because I don't know if we'll have one for this format before the championships conclude, but the championships will be a good reflection of what the top decks are, of course. So yeah, let's wrap it up there, guys. If you made it this far in the video, thank you again for watching. Hopefully this video helped you. Quantum is out.